Am I on? I heard a click too. Let me. Oh, there we go. That sounds right. <clears throat> Amen. All right. Well, let's uh, let's just kind of jump right into it this morning. Turn me, if you would, over to Acts chapter twenty. Acts chapter twenty. Um. And uh, preparing this message is a little bit unique um, with other um, messages that I've done is. Uh, because I had a really, really hard time with this one, um, really just kind of uh, connecting to what the Lord wanted me to, to bring. He, uh, uh, he, 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 he put a topic, he put a verse in my mind, and something that I had been pondering for several weeks now. Um, but I just had a really hard time kind of resonating with it. Um, and by the grace of God, he allowed us, uh, my family and I, to kind of go through... Uh, an incident, a trial, uh, just a few days ago, and it really kind of brought this whole thing to, to clarity for us. Um, as uh, many of you know, we were um, traveling to visit family during Thanksgiving. We went home, and uh, uh, we were uh, having a great stay. Uh, everything was well, visiting my family. Um, I got to meet the grandbaby. It was all great. Um, and then on our way uh, back here to San Diego, on the way to the airport, we uh, we uh, actually ended up getting into a pretty severe car accident. Um, and uh, by the grace of God, we uh, were all here. Um, see, what happened was, is there was a, uh, a young man who uh, swerved out of his lane and came at his head on. Uh, luckily, my, uh, my mother was able to maneuver the vehicle out of the way uh, to avoid a head-on collision, but uh, he clipped our back end, spun us around, and we ended up rolling um, several times down the road. Um, and by the grace of God, nobody was hurt. Uh, we were all able to get out of the vehicle and um, no injuries. I think my wife took the, took the brunt of it, so love on her a little bit if you, if you get the chance. She has a couple bruises. Um, but it was during that that the Lord said, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, the title of the message this morning is, We Shall Not Be Moved. We Shall Not Be Moved. So I want to do something a little bit different this morning um, as, we, as we get into it. If you, uh, if you could and you're able, please stand just out of respect for the Word of God. And uh, we'll go ahead and read Acts chapter 20, picking up in verse number 22. It says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone to preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity just to even be here this morning. And I just thank you, Lord, for your word, for your grace, uh, Lord, for your protection. Uh, Father, I just pray that uh, your message would go forth with power this morning, that you would just humble my heart, that you would just flow through me. Let me be your channel for your word today. Father, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts to receive you, that we'd be able to understand and grow closer to you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, go ahead and be seated. Uh, it's... I stumbled upon this, uh, upon this verse when I was uh, doing my, uh, uh, my devotions. It really stood out to me because the, uh, you really have to kind of understand what Paul's talking about here. Uh, you see, here he's talking to uh, the elders of the church of Ephesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Um, but this isn't a normal conversation. Uh, he knows, he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen, but he knows that if he goes to Jerusalem, as many have warned him, that He'll likely not return. 
So this is a, a very solemn conversation he's having with these men because really it's his final goodbye to the men of this church. And saying that, I know going to Jerusalem the bonds and afflictions will abide me and I know that you shall see my face no more. He's saying goodbye. But he also says a verse before that, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy. And to really kind of understand what he's talking about here, we kind of have to look into some of the things um, that Paul went through during the course of his ministry. Uh, so keep your place here in Acts chapter 20. Flip with me over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, we'll start in verse number 23. It says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. More in labors, more abundant. In stripes above measure. In, pres uh, in prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered, uh, uh, suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. So, as we kind of read through things, uh, you know, to me, the first thing that, that I said when I read through that was, wow. That is, uh, that's a lot. That's a man that's been through a lot. Um, and when I sort of began to sort of study how, how these things were, were performed, how these things were, were done to him, it really brought me a, a greater understanding to when he is able to say to those men, but none of these things move me. And that's really the whole theme of the message today and what I really want to drive home and everyone, uh, especially this morning, is that saying, but none of these things move me. So he says, five times received I 40 stripes, say one. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, 40 stripes, say one, that means 39. Um, but the importance of that number is that in Old Testament law, 40 stripes or 40 lashes was deemed enough to kill a man. 40 stripes was the death penalty. So what the Jews would do is, instead of uh, taking him out to kill him, they said, well, we'll give you 39. That's literally beating a man within an inch of his life. And what they would use is uh, called a flagon. It was a, a long leather whip. They would have a two, sometimes three thongs on it, and they would weight down the end of those with sharp metal or bone. And they'd whip him with all their might until those pieces would get lodged into his back and they'd rip him out. Five times. So thrice was I beaten with rods. And that's exactly how it sounds. It's just a staff or a large stick, and they would just beat him. Except this was a little bit different to the, uh, to the, to the stripes, is that there was no limit to this beating. They would keep going until one or two things happened. Either he would die, or they would just get tired of beating him. Thrice. So once was I stoned, and we can see this further back in uh, Acts chapter 14. We won't turn there, but he was uh, stoned, left for, uh, left for dead in Lystra. And you have to understand that stoning was the death penalty. You didn't get stoned and just live. That wasn't the purpose. And when he got stoned, they supposed that he was dead. They drug him out of the city so that he could be uh, taken care of by the animals. And by the grace of God, he 
rose up, went back into the city the next day and continued preaching the word of God. So thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. Now, we don't know the, the nature of this shipwreck. We know in, in, in certain instances, uh, uh, one particularly on his way to Rome, they ran aground on an island, and uh, we know that that was uh, no small thing there when they uh, came across um, uh, a, a cannibal tribe, and he uh, was out fetching firewood, got bit in the arm by a viper. Now, isn't that just the worst of luck? After you get shipwrecked, now you're bitten by a snake. <laughs> you're, you're running aground on an island where everyone wants to eat you. That's just... <laughs> Horrible, horrible. But also we know that one of these, uh, uh, at least one of these occasions, he said he spent a night and a day in the deep. Now, if you can imagine, mm. Mm. even the strongest of swimmers mm. in the middle of the ocean where you can't touch, nothing to hang on to, for 24 hours, you can't sleep while you're drowned, mm. no food, no water, the salt water dehydrating you, sapping every ounce of energy that you have, And then he goes to say, in journeyings, often he's always on the move, in perils of waters, perils of robbers, beaten and stripped of everything he had, perils by my own countrymen. Now this would be like the people you grew up with. The neighbors down the block. Your people. Betrayed and perils by my own countrymen. And perils by the heathen. Perils in the city. Perils in the wilderness. Perils in the sea. And perils among false brethren. This would be the equivalent to having a, uh, like a member of the church or a friend in Christ, at least you thought was a friend in Christ, betrayed. Uh, what comes to my mind is, uh, immediately what comes to my mind is whenever he, uh, whenever he writes, Demas hath forsaken me. People he thought was his friend, someone he traveled with, perils by false brother. In weariness, and painfulness, and constant pain, I believe that, uh, you know, just reading through these things, uh, you know, we kind of have a, a, a sort of a mental idea, at least I do, of what these people might look like. Um, and, you know, reading through this, I, I, I believe that, that Paul would just, if he was to stand up here today, he would just be horribly scarred yeah. from his head down to his feet covered in scars. Almost every bone in his body had been broken, disformed, disfigured. Beaten and left for dead more times than he can count. It says in washings often, always on guard, and hunger, and in thirst, and fastings often, and I don't believe that this is a, a, a spiritual fasting where, you know, we might fast for, for a leadership conference or an event. I think uh, that he was in fasting just because he didn't have anything to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And cold and nakedness. And then if that wasn't enough, if you look over in chapter 12, verse number 7... It says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So on top of that, he's also been given a thorn in the flesh, an affliction. And also says the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So now he has demonic opposition on top of all those things. But none of these things move me. You know, reading through all this, I just, I can't help but think, but how, how could somebody go that far? What was his drive? 
And he really says it plainly uh, in chapter 12, verse number 9, as, uh, right where we are, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. But none of these things move me. If you flip back over to Acts chapter 20, where you're holding your place... And what I really want you to, to focus on is verse 24. He says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with what? Joy. With joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That I might finish my course with joy. Well, what course is that? And, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, Paul's very unique. He had a very unique ministry. Um, you know, the Lord called him to do very, uh, something very specific. Um, but it's not. It says that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And that's all it is. Testifying the gospel of the grace of God. The Lord's called us to do a very specific job. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an illustration this morning. Uh, it's a Bible story. I love Bible stories. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to just read through this. And I really think it ties in. It applies well. Luke chapter 19, verse number 29 Verse number 29. And it came to pass when he was come nigh into Bethage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go ye into the village over against you, which at your entering you shall find a colt tied whereon you, uh, yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. Now, that's something that kind of caught my eye back up a little bit. It says, but the Lord, God, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God, the creator of the universe. And then what's it say? Hath need. He needs something. Come on. Hath need of what? Of him? Of a, of a donkey? Now, that struck me as kind of odd. Uh, at all the things in the world, at all things in this universe that the Lord might have need of, he has need of a, of a donkey. Uh, and, you know, doing a little bit of research, the only, uh, the only time that it says the Lord hath need of anything, it's in reference to this passage right here in the whole Bible. The Lord hath need of him. So, brethren, I kind of think that if God has need of a of a donkey, all right, come on, then He might need us for something too. Come on, amen. Here you go. Uh, just kind of imagine with me for a minute. Um, uh, just kind of think uh, what your dream car would be. All right, so now imagine you have, you, you know, you have this car, pictured in your mind, right? Some of you might be a, a big, uh, fancy pickup truck. Some of you might like the Ferraris or Lamborghinis. Uh, 
You know, some of y'all might just be happy with a little Red Rider bicycle. I don't know, amen. But, <clears throat> but just think, think you have this this car in your mind, and and uh, uh, you uh, you have the cash for it. You pay for it outright. It's yours. Uh, you go to the dealership, you go in, you sign the title, you hand you the keys, and you're walking out. You're like, go get on my new car. Walking out, you see it on the lot, it's all shining, the sun glinting off of it. Tires are all polished. As you're walking over to your car, you see a couple guys getting into it, and you're like, uh, uh, excuse me, um, that's, uh, that's, that, that's my car. Hmm. Say, oh, it's fine, the, the, the Lord has need of this. <laughs> oh, my. Amen. And that's kind of the equivalent of what that was, because that colt yeah. was a valuable asset. Yeah. For never a man sat that brand new car that's never been driven. Yeah. Now some stranger that you don't know is getting in and saying, let me take those keys from you. The Lord hath need of this. And you know, I don't know about you, but I say, oh, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, do you need a, I mean, I'll give you a ride somewhere. You need a ride? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Like how, like, how long do you need it for? Um, you know, some sort of collateral, and to get your something. Um, but I, I find it interesting because what, what happened was is they came in, verse 33, it says, and as they were loosing the cult, the owners thereof say, why use Lucy the cult? But hey, that's, uh, what are you doing there, bud? And they said, the Lord had need of him. And they brought the cult to Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Which again brings the question, if the Lord had needed something so simple as a cult, as a donkey, how much more does he need you and I? Amen. Amen. See, what a lot of people fail to understand is that if you're saved, if you're a born-again believer here this morning, then you are a part of the ministry. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, sir. And nobody joins the ministry to quit. Nobody joins anything to quit. Because if you join with the intent to quit, why are you even there in the first place? Yeah, Amen. Yeah. But then it kind of makes you think a little bit, well, why does the, the Lord need us? Well, the answer is he really doesn't. Amen. If you look down in verse number 39, it says, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, and this is as he's riding into Jerusalem on their shouting Hosanna and praising his name. So some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Mm. So God's going to get his glory. Amen. He's going to get the praise and glory he's due. Mm. Whether it comes from you or whether it comes from the stones. Mm -hmm. So why does he have need of us? For our sake. It's for our sake. So that we can be a witness to each other of his goodness and his grace, and we can take part in his work and his will. This is, I just imagine this, you know, Jesus is riding through Jerusalem and everyone's shouting Hosanna and laying down the palm leaves and, and praising him as he's coming in that. The owners of that donkey were just kind of standing there saying, hey, it's my donkey. <laughs> you see, Jesus would have rode into Jerusalem in glory anyway. All right. But what he did is he allowed somebody to give what they had to do what they could for his glory. So that they could be a witness of what God can do for us and through us. Mm -hmm. Which is a lot of the reason why I believe that the Lord allows us to go through so many things in our life. Amen. So many trials and afflictions. Mm -hmm. 
so that we can take those things and those experiences and be witnesses to each other. And say, hey, look, I know it hurts. I know what you're going through is rough. But hey, I've been through the same thing. And none of these things move me. Amen. See, sometimes God just requires some things of us. You know, for everybody it's different. It could be our finances. It could be our time. It could be our gifts, our talents. It could be our bodies. I can tell you one thing that the Lord always requires of us is his trust. Amen. Is to be able to trust him and his will. Second Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. Everybody. <clears throat> now, it may not be as severe as what we saw that Paul went through. But it's going to happen. It doesn't say that you might suffer persecution. Maybe you'll have some persecution. It says you shall. It's going to happen. But it's our responsibility to take those things and bring them to the Lord as willingly as we would any other thing. And say, Lord, I know that this is tough. And I may not understand what or why you're doing right now, but none of these things move me. Amen. Because I know that you have need of me. Amen. And because of that, we have hope and we have strength in our infirmities and in our afflictions. Turn with me real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter number four. We're going to start in verse number seven and uh, read down through the rest of the chapter. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but through our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Amen. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The thing we have to remember is that we're really not here for very long. Yeah. Our life here on this earth is but a vapor. And uh, I, uh, some kind of, some kind of interesting. I was, uh, I was talking uh, about this with one of uh, um, one of the brothers here, and uh, we were kind of doing some math, and um, it was a. Uh, 
just thinking about the, 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 the fraying of days as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day into the Lord. So we're just kind of doing some math out of curiosity and kind of fudging some numbers a little bit. And he said, well, how much in all of the, you know, the span of all eternity is a, an average person's lifespan? So we'll average out about 70 years. And we did some math and um, about 86 seconds is what we came up with. If we count each day as being a thousand years, about 86 seconds, less than a minute and a half. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of time. It really brings a perspective like how quickly our life is over. How much of a vapor it truly is. But in that time, the Lord has need of each and every one of us. We don't have the time to be <clears throat> we don't have the time to get caught up in trials and persecution. We really don't. And just kind of thinking about some of the, some of the ways uh, you know as we looked at how Paul was persecuted and, and it still blows my mind that people can get so offended. Oh, well, so-and-so hurt my feelings, so I just don't want to go back to that church anymore. Oh, well, I feel like I'm being underutilized, so I'm going to go somewhere where I'm more appreciated. That's not the point. It's not the point. The point is that we might finish our course with joy. And the ministry which I received the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's the point. And part of our job is to take those things as they arise and say, but none of these things move me. An old Texas preacher by the name of Ron Thomas uh, said, and I really like this quote, I'll read it to you. He says, so many times we think of courage as a quality reserved for soldiers, police and firefighters, and our day-to-day -day existence security is emphasized over courage. We're taught to play it safe. Because of this, we let fear rule our lives. Mm -hmm. The fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of going broke, fear of being alone, the fear of humiliation, the fear of public speaking, the fear of being ostracized by family and friends, the fear of physical discomfort, the fear of regret, the fear of success. Mm -hmm. Ambrose Redmond said, courage is not the absence of fear but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. Courageous people are still afraid, but they don't let the fear paralyze them. Amen. See, there'll be times in everybody's life when they have to make up their minds to stand up and not back down. Amen. It's during those times that we have to hold fast to our faith and say, but none of these things move me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity just to preach your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, for uh, really just drawing me closer to you and developing uh, your word. And Father, I just thank you so much for the way that you've uh, just worked in this room today. Father, I I uh, just pray that we would meditate on these things, meditate on your word, grow closer to you, and that we would uh, just be changed for the better. Well, I pray that as we uh, prepare ourselves to go into the, uh, the main service, Lord, that we would uh, just prepare our hearts and our minds to receive it, to receive your word again, that you would just anoint pastor with the Holy Ghost, and you give him power and boldness to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.